So for Pukraj, it is across the seven seas. Pukraj, Pukraj is now in Nebraska. And uh, as someone commented that we have, we have, have we lost Pukraj to the West? I think it's no. Pukraj, you need to come back and be with us once more after your stint in the West. Thank you um, for your kind words. Um, I'll begin with my opening slide. Um, and this is related to identification of uh, urinary biomarkers for age-related macular degeneration. So we know that age-related macular degeneration is a leading cause of irreversible blindness in the elderly. And uh, even though anti-VEGF is an established gold standard for wet AMD, the treatment for dry AMD remains elusive. So for 100 cases of AMD, 90 cases are that of dry AMD. And it's still a big challenge. So here in the, with the lack of an established treatment, early detection is critical, which can um, be detected by identifying early biomarkers and uh, screening um, at-risk patients. So we also know uh, that AMD has a low-grade systemic inflammation and that biomarkers from body fluids could reflect the status of AMD. So this, was, this statement was ex essentially the research question for us that since AMD has a low-grade systemic inflammation, could we tap biomarkers from body fluids um, uh, which could reflect the status of AMD and identify high-risk um, uh, patients? So we saw there were two uh, previous speakers who spoke about uh, biomarkers of disease uh, in Anand's paper and Dr. Natasha's paper. So the, the biomarkers are uh, finding increasing importance in early detection of disease. So uh, between blood and urine, we, we try to target urine biomarkers because it's collected more easily, it's more uh, non-invasive, it has a widespread uh, potential application, uh, you know, even back in the rural setting. So with that, um, uh, we embarked on uh, a proteomics based approach for identification of these biomarkers. And um, so, what is um, so at the outset, we wanted to know what's known about the genetics of AMD in India. Surprisingly, we found only two good papers uh, with uh, single nucleotide polymorphism in CFH and C3 genes from India. So, there's really a paucity, and the genetics of AMD is not very well understood in India. However, the burden of disease is humongous. So we know that um, early a AMD uh, is about 21%, late um, age retinal maculopathy is about 2.3%. This in a country of 1.4 billion people amounts to a huge patient load. So these figures come from the Shankar Netralia uh, Rural Urban, urban uh, Age Retinal Macular Degeneration Study. So with that background information in mind, uh, we started the study with three goals to identify urinary biomarkers specific to Drusen, CNV, and geographic atrophy, analyze gene polymorphisms in C3 and CFH, because that's what was already established, and test the diagnostic utility of the urinary biomarkers as a bedside tool. Why urine? Because um, it's a rich source of biomarkers, easy to collect, and preserves the stability of the proteome. The eye and kidney share similarities in the developmental uh, cycles, uh, pathological and physiological similarities. And there is an association of chronic kidney disease and AMD as seen in major epidemiological studies like Blue Mountain Eye Disease Study. So this was a cross-sectional study at Chantanetralia over three years, we were IRB approved. We had three disease groups, namely early AMD, late AMD with geographic atrophy and late AMD with broadly vascularization. We had 22 controls. Um, we had a, a thorough patient history. Um, and um, this is important to rule out confounders. And we had exclusion criteria in which we ruled out people with renal disease, systemic inflammatory disease like lupus, arthritis, um, which could uh, impair the renal function test with uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes, and also patients with a history of nephrotoxic drugs. Urine samples and peripheral blood were collected and a clinical examination was performed. The patients were categorized according to the international classification of AMD. 
uh, these were the three groups and we also had a, a control group. Um, the urine um, protein was uh, analyzed in mass spectrometry and validated by ELISA and PCR was used to do uh, to assay the SNPs in CFH and uh, C3 genes. So this is the study design and appropriate statistical tests were done. So to begin with, we had 751 proteins and we gradually step by step, you know, um, uh, kind of ran them through the sieve and uh, we saw that 383 were differentially expressed, 48 matched with the previous database and 16 of them were upregulated in both early and late. And we finally selected three proteins which had a gradual increase in the fold chain from early to advanced AMD because AMD is a slowly progressive disease. So these three proteins were Serpina-1, TIMP-1, and APUA-1. So this is the mass spec uh, images of these three, and this is the box and whisker plot of urinary protein levels. Um, these are the pathways which are deregulated in AMD. And uh, this is a table with the uh, validation. Here you can see the, there is a more than 15 fold change in APOA, more than four fold change in TIMP1 and a, a double increase in Serpina1. So what's the diagnostic utility of validated proteins? This should uh, pass the statistical test. And here you see we had a kind of a hitch in the study that the ROC curve was about 65% uh, for all three proteins just from the urine. So we, uh, we also included the tests, the PCR tests of the blood samples, and we tried to increase the discrimination value of the uh, power of the diagnosis. So here you see from 65, when we included um, both the urine and blood, it increased to 80%. And uh, for APOA, it increased from 66% to 82%. And for Serpina, it increased from 65% to 73%. So the novelty of the study was that um, we had a discovery of biomarkers and potential therapeutic targets, um, which was different from previous studies because they uh, only identified differentially expressed proteins be between controls and AMD in general. They did not classify it between early and late disease. And uh, by categorizing the late disease um, patients, we could potentially identify them at an early stage. And we, our study employed a novel scheme to identify proteins that gradually increase with disease progression, since AMD is a slowly progressive disease. So uh, Serpina-1 uh, is enhanced in early AMD, APOA-1 is enhanced in CNVM patients, and TIMP-1 is enhanced in uh, geographic atrophy patients. So there were some uh, limitations to our study. The sample size uh, of age-matched geographic atrophy was not that uh, large because geographic atrophy is not very common in India. And, um, you know, with the life expectancy increasing, we could see more of this in the future, but that is the, the changing landscape of the clinical presentation that we see. There is a difference in age controls compared to AMD groups. Of course, the early or younger patients won't have AMD. Um, a lack of smoking and alcohol is higher in the control group. Yeah, because these are the risk factors for AMD. However, we incorporated allele status of risk conferring SNPs in AMD, which is not affected by person's behavior or any other comorbidity. So to conclude, urinary serpina TIMP1 and APOA1 are elevated in AMD. There is a significant association of these polymorphisms in CFH and C3 genes in Indians. And these results enable early diagnosis of AMD using urine samples, which will help in early detection and lifestyle modification and slowing down of disease progression and it could potentially lead to a point of care device for mass screening and identifying the cases of C3 inhibition therapy for dry MD because there's a recent paper on pexetacoplan for geographic atrophy secondary to AMD. And uh, we saw that uh, this could, if uh, TIMP1 is elevated in geographic atrophy patients using the urine sample, they could make um, good candidates for receiving pexetacoplan. So these are my collaborators. So with that, I would like to um, come to my takeaway uh, messages. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that you know um, you should have a protected academic time, and uh, you may be a busy practitioner, but in order to um, 
analyze um, and extract value, additional value from your work, you need to have protected academic time. The second thing I would like to say is to identify the challenges in your practice. And these are unique to everyone. It could be different in geographic locations. For example, you know, this case of um, increased incidence of fundal coloboma in Chitrakoot, for example. So Dr. Aloksen is working on that and that's peculiar to that part. Likewise, you know, um, there could be some other problem in some other part of the country. So we need to formulate a research question, contextualize it to your practice, and then try to work on that. Um, we get a lot of ideas every day, but we need to brainstorm uh, about those issues, um, separate the chaff from the rice, and uh, uh, make sure it is not a so what uh, idea that we are working on. To be able to say that, we should be aware of the literature and more importantly, the gaps in the knowledge. Uh, so for that, we need um, a good uh, basic knowledge and understanding of the disease. And then um, uh, as a clinician, we, what we can at the least do is a methodical documentation of what we see. And this is what I've learned from several of my mentors, Dr. Tarun Sharma, Dr. Jyotirme Biswas and Dr. Carol Shields. And also I've heard from Anita Agarwal say the same thing about JDM gas. Uh, also, you know, there's uh, the things are changing so fast that, uh, you know, there's an explosion in imaging. And uh, now, you know, there is kind of a democratization of what tools are available with the frugal innovation. You know, we can document more and more um, disease features. And then uh, all we have to do is analyze that. So if we review the cases, we might be able to detect the pattern and if we have a bunch of these cases, uh, which have not been reported before, it could be a new entity. Um, having a mentor, um, as uh, the previous speakers uh, pointed out, is a very important thing because you need a critical review. We may be over, um, you know, aiming or be kind of uh, over ambitious, uh, but you know, the the mentors will help us have a critical review. Collaboration is important because one may not have all the equipment and all the skill. So you harness and um, all that, uh, like Dr. Kalpana highlighted, you know, forestry to the ground level worker and then um, to the molecular biologist, parasitologist um, and things like that, you have to weave them all in one fabric. So um, another thing that I learned um, uh, working in Shankar Nitrale is, you know, uh, to have your app stack ready because you never know, you know, at a short notice, you may be asked to present something and um, from your Excel sheet, you can quickly transfer this um, uh, facts and figures and you are ready to go at a short notice. Um, for the innovation, I think there's a lot of disruptive innovation, innovation happening nowadays. Uh, it's best to contextualize, um, especially like what we saw from Dr. Mishra. Uh, these are we are dealing uh, with the retinal imaging, we are dealing with very high expensive equipment. And in the third world context, I think we need to have uh, the tools and ideas available to be able to maximize uh, what we get uh, from this highly expensive uh, equipment and also to indigenize them like the forest camera we have for ROP and retinoblastoma and pediatric retinal diseases. And um, in the end, I would we say that keep time. going, disruptive ideas do see the light of the day and you have to be persistent and consistent. And uh, I think for me, uh, awards are just byproducts. Uh, well, I uh, do like to mention that I've been on for the Langachari for three times and in the third time I was lucky. But I think the journey is real and uh, it's the social impact that okay, you have is more, yeah, is more rewarding than anything else. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Pukraj, and thank you very much. A very special thanks to you for being there with us from US. Uh, so, Arup, your comments, please. Pukraj, uh, nice to see you, and uh, congratulations on this wonderful research that you have done. You know, I can't kind of uh, feel out of place because I have made about five or six trips to the final Rangachari session, never won it, but now I know what it takes to make a winner with all these people who have done fabulous work and you have really highlighted and outlined the way you have gone about doing the research. That is really commendable. Uh, one question that I wanted to ask you, Pukraj, is 
you know, have has a, had proteomics been used in the diagnosis of any retinal condition earlier? How did you get this concept? How did you get this concept? So the thing is that you know we are always um, frustrated in trying to deal with patients with geographic atrophy and end stage disease, and being at a tertiary care center, you know, it's like a hopeless condition. So we try to uh, the idea is. And then we have treatment failures. You keep injecting and you know, it doesn't work anymore at a point. So the idea was how to detect it early. So sitting in a tertiary care center, you cannot have uh, you know, a grassroots presence. So you have to um, kind of um, enable um, uh, something at the grassroots level. So the background is that we already had a chip based device for detecting um, pathogens, limited pathogens in end of vitreous sample from endophthalmitis patients. So um, that was a collaborative um, um, project between LVP, Arvind, and Shankar Nitralia. So uh, the idea was there. There's some background knowledge was already there that uh, if we take a drop of uh, undiluted vitreous sample and put it on this chip-based device, uh, we could know which is the causative organism given in that panel. So we take the most common pathogens, and you know you can color code it to uh, say that it is staph or strep or pseudomonas, for example. So likewise, we took, uh, so for it to be, you know, really popular and easy and feasible, you need a non-invasive way of collecting a, some kind of a body, flu body fluid. So it can't be blood because it's invasive. So it has to be the other body fluid could be, you know, saliva or urine. So urine is so much more easy and, you know, like a healthcare worker is able to handle that. So, you know, we also kind of revert, uh, work backwards uh, thinking that you know if you have to have a device like that what do we need so then we thought that there is a need to look at the urinary biomarkers so are we scientifically sound on that yes we saw the blue mountain eye disease study saying that you know the kidney and the eye so for example the choroid and the uh, and the uh, glomeruli they have so many things even the developmental pathways common so and then we had to be careful to rule out patients who had uh, renal disease of other causes like SLE or you know, nephrotoxic drugs or diabetes. So, uh, because they also cause uh, renal function um, failure. So we wanted to make sure that it's only coming from AMD and not from something else. So then, you know, kind of uh, uh, traced our path forward and back going backward. And that's how this idea came about. So this research is funded by uh, the uh, one of the I think uh, one of the government departments also, um, I think biotechnology, and uh, we work very closely with the basic scientists. Uh, the, one of the key, uh, I think the key, the PI for this project was Dr. Krishna Kumar, uh, who has a wide uh, interest ranging from AMD to retinoblastoma. Uh, so he has a very good sound knowledge of the uh, disease. And then, you know, that's how we took it forward. One, uh, one final question to Pukraj is, in this journey from bench to bedside, where is your research located right now? I mean, it's a wonderful work. You have a lot of you know, original thinking and work has gone into it. But uh, what is the final outcome in terms of uh, you know clinicians? So utility? two fronts. Yeah, one, this has to be validated by other centers that you know this is unique to Indian subjects. So if somebody from the North, East or West does it, you know, it kind of validates our work. Second thing, the point of care device has to be fabricated. So, you know, uh, and it has to be a low cost thing so that uh, uh, that it can be marketed and, you know, uh, with a drop of urine, you can tell that, you know, this patient is going to has a high risk for having a geographic atrophy or CMD. So Thank we're you. working on that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bhalla, you wish to say yeah. something? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's a very wonderful idea, Dr. Pokhraj, which you have done. Uh, you have really simplified the whole approach of uh, classifying the patient of ARMD, whether they are going to develop a CNVM or uh, uh, the, the, this thing, gyrate atrophy, just on the basis of urinary analysis. And uh, I think it has a great uh, practical approach because, uh, you, as you men mentioned, that these three, Serpina, APO, APOA, and uh, TIMP1 can be detected. And uh, I think... With that, you have also opened the channels for uh, further urinary uh, analysis into uh, other retinal diseases also, maybe uh, other degenerative retinal diseases and uh, the...
I think one of the slides you mentioned that uh, Pexitacoplan is one of the innovative drugs which can be tried for uh, patients having uh, temp one in their ur uh, urinary analysis. I think it, it sounds very exciting, sir. 